big misconceptions of homesickness are that it's only a child's emotion and that it's something we get over by going to summer camp or going to college. And in reality, it's an adult condition uh, as well as a child's condition. It's always plagued adults on the move. But unfortunately, we've had to silence our homesickness because we worry that it makes us look immature. Uh, one early influence when I came to Utah and started thinking about homesickness was just discovering the name of that mountain right there, the big one. Uh, it's named Ben Lomond, and shortly after I arrived here, somebody told me it was named by a homesick Scottish immigrant, uh, a Mormon woman who had come out here. And I thought, well, that's not part of any narrative I've ever heard about westward migration, that people were actually thinking of places they'd left behind. And, and that mountain got me thinking that maybe my experience of being homesick was one that was widely shared across the centuries. I moved out here to Utah with my husband and we were both very eager to come west, but I suddenly realized once I was here how much I missed my family in the Midwest. And uh, I wondered if I was strange about, uh, in that way because I'd heard for generations that Americans had set out west and never looked back and that it was an easy process. I just expected when I grew up I would move from home and get a job and suddenly I found that very difficult. And I wondered if I was some sort of anomaly. Um, and the more I began to investigate the topic, I realized it was actually quite a prominent theme in American history, um, but one that had been overlooked by historians. I found that any archive I went to in the United States, I could easily turn up um, people reflecting on their homesickness in the 19th century or the 18th century, the colonial period, um, talking about how painful it was to leave home and family and possibly have no chance of going back and um, how, how they struggled with that emotion. One thing that really struck me was that in the 19th century, Americans were very public about their homesickness. They um, made the most popular song in America, Home Sweet Home. Uh, it was written in 1823 and for the next mm, several decades, it topped the charts. Um, and that one would bring Americans to tears because everybody seemed to have been moving in the 19th century. Home, home, sweet, sweet home. Um, so it was this common publicly discussed emotion. There really wasn't a tremendous shame attached to being homesick. Um, that's only developed in the course of the 20th century. In fact, it was so um, acceptable to be homesick that uh, the military made accommodations for it. Um, all sorts of institutions recognized that it was a real problem. For instance, during the Civil War, um, people who were acutely homesick were called nostalgic. Nostalgia used to mean uh, a strong longing for home, and people thought you could die of it. So during the Civil War, over 5,000 soldiers on the Union Army were diagnosed as being acutely nostalgic, and 72 actually died of nostalgia. Um, that's how seriously homesickness was taken in the 19th century. Here's a letter from a Civil War soldier fighting for the Confederacy in 1861. Oh, how I wish last night, after reading your letter twice, to be with you and our sweet children. I can hardly sleep. My thoughts were of my happy home and dear, kind, sweet wife and our sweet ones. And his expressions of homesickness were absolutely typical of Civil War soldiers, black and white, north and south. I, I read hundreds of journals and they all were saying the same thing. Unfortunately, Dawson never made it home. He was killed in battle the following year. The symptoms of homesickness that were most common were fevers, rapid pulses, uh, dysentery was often associated with the disease, heart palpitations, uh, throbbing of your arteries. Um, all of these were listed as uh, well-known correlates of the, of the condition. And uh, it, they could get so bad that people could actually die of the condition as a result during the Civil War, both armies were known to discharge soldiers if they were truly homesick because the only cure for homesickness was to return somebody home. Um, failing that, you might get uh, furlough home so you could temporarily recover. There were also all sorts of interesting regulations like army bands were forbidden to play Home Sweet Home because they worried the song would make soldiers pass out or weep uncontrollably. Today, we would say they are not suffering from homesickness. They probably have dysentery and their depression is exacerbating the condition. In the 19th century, um, that mind-body distinction wasn't quite as well fleshed out and people really uh, believed that the psychological condition could have these real physical consequences. Well, I think there were lots of imperatives to move in the 20th century. We became a global power and we needed a military that could um, deploy soldiers all over the world. Uh, so you see de 
increasing sympathy for the condition starting in World War I and continuing during World War II, um, where people will still occasionally get diagnosed with nostalgia, but there's a lot more impatience and a lot more of a sense that these people are, quote, big babies. Um, during the Cold War, one doctor at the University of Pennsylvania called um, mothers who kept their sons too tightly wound to their apron cords, America's gravest menace, because they were raising a generation of homesick sissies who'd be unable to fight the communists. So military needs certainly drove um, the, the drove the efforts to repress homesickness, so too did the rise of uh, corporate capitalism. Um, companies would need to deploy workers across the nation and across the world. Some people joked in the 1960s that IBM stood for I've been moved, uh, and people were relocated. You were supposed to be the organization man and loyal to the bureaucracy you were working for, whether it was the government or whether it was a private company. Um, you were supposed to be footloose and go where needed. And so homesickness in that context became a very inconvenient emotion because you know, if you, your workers are constantly going home, if your soldiers are leaving the battlefield to fight, that's not going to be a particularly effective workforce or fighting force. I think in the military, I think uh, in populations on the move, uh, you do see this as a recurrent problem and one that people are really loath to admit because it's a sign of dependency. It's a sign of weakness to say that you want to be where your mom is or your husband is or where your children are. Uh, so I think people are very resistant to it because it seems like this childish emotion. I thought originally my story was going to be that people had learned to repress this emotion over time. And what I found was that people had learned to repress the public expressions of the emotion over time, but that in their daily life, whether it was in the food they were eating or the sports teams they were rooting for from afar or the television programs they were watching back streamed into their new living rooms from their old homelands, um, they were still maintaining these very vital connections to home. And even in the people they were Facebooking with and texting and Snapchatting with, um, there was a real effort to contain a, maintain a connection to home. So that even while we celebrate this idea of Americans as rugged individualists who can move on, cut ties, never look back, in our daily lives, we don't, we don't fulfill that mythology. We're much more connected than our individualist rhetoric might make us think.